A warm welcome to today's talk. It's Tuesday, the 1st of February. Now, we're going to be thinking about vaccine mandates and the science about that, because I can't say whether President Biden is right or wrong with his vaccine mandates for healthcare workers, but we can look at some of the science, which will raise some legitimate questions, I think, about this. Just before we go on, we notice that the cases in the UK have gone up today by 800,000 because we are now counting people that are reinfected. In other words, someone can be on the register twice because they've been infected twice. So that's the reason for the big change in cases today in the United Kingdom. It's not actually that there's been 800,000 cases today. Now, vaccine mandates is really quite an important thing to look at. Now, Sajid Javid, it looks like he's going to scrap these on Monday, which is interesting and I think probably a good idea. Omicron variant's dominant, um, it's milder, and uh, I think he's paid cognizance to the data we're about to present as well. Because it had been that people would have to get the first vaccine to be to be fully vaccinated for April, they'd have had to get the first vaccine by uh, this week, and that's now looking not necessary. Of course, care home staff, it's been mandated for them since uh, November, and it looks like 40,000 people who lost their jobs because they weren't fully vaccinated can now go back to work. And that's going to make a big difference in the care sector, a very welcome boost in staffing for the care sector, we would hope. And this is consistent with the Prime Minister's idea that the UK has to learn to live with COVID, which of course is true. Now, this is the grouping from the United States about the vaccine mandates. So I put the links there. Do, do click on them for yourself. And really, it's, it's, quite, it's quite profound, this. The, the Supreme Court has upheld, or it's been, if you live in the States, you know about this, President Biden mandated uh, vaccination, double vaccination for all healthcare workers. There was lots of court appeals. And I think Texas hasn't been decided yet, but there's about 25 states are ready where it's going ahead. Now the rest of the states, about another 24 states, have been told to join onto this by the Supreme Court. So it really is quite a profound thing affecting millions of people, as, as we'll see. So uh, th this was the group that's uh, put forward the mandate this health care workers uh, in 20 in 24 states are going to be affected by this that's 10 million workers it's an incredible amount of people infected by this 76,000 healthcare facilities with medicare and uh, medicare programs are going to be infected by this and they must receive at least shot one shot within 30 days must be fully vaccinated by the 15th of march and these are the states where it's changed so i'm not going to read through them all but this basically joins the other 25 states where the mandates are already going ahead. So basically what this means is there's mandates now for all of the United States, for all healthcare workers. And some people might think that this is a fairly, uh, a fairly dramatic, dramatic step to take. Now, as I say, I can't really say whether the politics of this are right or wrong. But we can look at some uh, data here from the CDC. And let's do that now. So here's the first graphic I want to show you. Uh, from this is this is from the CDC. And this we have actually seen these before. Um, now this is, if we look at the top here, we see that this is. Uh, let's get rid of me on this. You don't want me on this one. So I want to go to that one. There we go. Um, now this is based on the incidence of laboratory confirmed COVID-19 cases amongst different immunological cohorts by vaccination and previous diagnosis history, New York. So it's basically cases in New York. And the key thing here is we need to look at this key. Now this, this here, th 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 this, is, this is people that have not been vaccinated and have not been exposed to the infection. So they're at high risk because as we go up here, we come to uh, increasing levels of risk. So no question, these people are at high risk. But then we look down and people at much lower risk have been vaccinated. So this line here, these people have been vaccinated, as we see on there, but they've not been exposed to the actual virus. Whereas this line here, with much lower risk, are people that have been exposed to the virus. And this black line here is people that have been exposed to the virus and have been vaccinated. So you could argue that they're slightly less risk. But basically, there's not a great deal of difference between those groups. 
So what, what we see is that people that have had the natural infection are enjoying very high levels of protection against infection. And of course, if they've got high levels of defense against protection, they're not going to get infected. And of course, if they're not infected, the virus is not multiplying in their bodies. So they can't breathe it out. They can't infect other people. So um, that indicates to me that people that have had the natural infection are going to have much lower rates of spread. Now let's look at this next one here. This one is, um, I think this one, is this one California? Yeah, this one's from California. So there's much the same data there from, from California. This is the CDC's own data. So again, we see people that have not been vaccinated and people that have not had the infection. I mean, can there be any doubt from that data that they are at severe risk of infection, therefore severe risk of passing this on to other people? Clearly, that is the case. Clearly, that is the case. But when we look at people that have been vaccinated, we see that their risk is low, way lower, of course, in the California data. But then when we look at people that have had the natural infection, which is that blue dotted line there, we see that they have way lower risk and people that have had the extra vaccine dose, you could argue that they've got minusculely uh, less risk. But, but basically, those lines are essentially superimposed. So that is quite um, interesting, again, that we've got consistency between the data from uh, California and New York. Now, the third graphic here I want to show you is this one. And this one is the risk of hospitalizations. Now, that is th here. So um, this is um, associated hospitalizations here amongst immunological cohorts, again, defined by vaccine status, California. And this is from May, uh, May the 30th to November the 13th, 2021. Now, of course, this is in the time of Delta. So again, what we see is people likely to be, and of course, th this goes up and down as the pandemic goes up and down, as the numbers go up and down. That's not surprising. So we see people with no vaccine at all and no immunity at all, very high risk of hospitalization. But then we go down and we see people here uh, with the thick blue dotted line that have had two doses of vaccine, much lower risk of hospitalization, of course. But we see people that have had the natural infection on the dotted blue line there, but have not been vaccinated at all, even lower risk than the people that have had vaccines. Then the people that have had uh, no infection and immunity and vaccination, again, I think we'd have to say that line is, is basically superimposed most of the time there. So I see this as, as really quite, uh, quite significant data because... What this means is we're not really treating everyone the same. So let me just tell you a bit about the background here. When I went into uh, healthcare uh, when I was 18, we had something called uh, task orientation. So, so what we did was we'd do the, uh, we'd do the background and rub everyone's bottom and then, then we'd do the pillow round and sort everyone's pillows out. Then we'd do the cup of tea round and give everyone the cup of tea. Then we'd do the dressings round, do everyone's dressings. And then we'd, then we'd do the medicines, do everyone's dressings all at the same time. Great, because you knew when everything was done for the whole ward. But then it changed to individualised care. And in individualised care, you assess, plan, implement, evaluate. So you assess the individual. You, having assessed the individual, you plan their care individually. Then you implement the care, then you assess it. So what's happening here with these vaccine mandates is, is they're saying all healthcare workers should be vaccinated. But the data we've shown, to me, is showing that people that have already had the infection, the vaccination makes basically no difference to their risk of getting the infection or, or to their risk of being hospitalised. Now, to be fair, this was uh, in the time of Delta. So this may not apply to Omicron, but I'd be very surprised if it didn't because Omicron's milder anyway. So if you protect, if, if, the, if the immunity protects against uh, Delta, I strongly suspect it's going to protect against severe symptomatic Omicron, although we know that people get milder symptomatic Omicron, but less likely to be hospitalised. So in the age of Omicron, I would argue that this applies uh, even more. So 
we should be individualizing care to me from, from that data. So what this means is the individual should be treated as an individual, not as 10 million or 20 million healthcare workers or whatever it is. So if we say, well, to an individual healthcare worker, well, you've had a positive PCR test. We know you've had the infection. Therefore, you don't need to be vaccinated. We, we could say that. Or we could say, well, we're not sure whether you had the infection or not, but we'll do an antibody test. And if you're antibody positive to, 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 to the membrane protein and the envelope, pro envelope protein, we'll know you've had the infection and therefore you don't need to be vaccinated. So we're vaccinating people who actually don't need vaccinated because, of course, healthcare workers have had ex more exposure to the infection than anyone else. So it does seem a bit uh, a bit strange that this one size fits all when the whole philosophy of healthcare at the moment is individualized care but we're not doing individualized care for the individualized healthcare worker so it seems to go against the whole philosophical predisposition of healthcare that I've been practicing now for uh, for, for for the last 30 years Okay, now um, I'm going to just play you one more thing about deaths. This is from Spencer, who's done a really good report on deaths. Now, you might remember that there's been all sorts of uh, talk going on about deaths. And, and, and I did say on my video that I thought the most accurate indicator of how many people we've lost from this pandemic is the excess deaths over the, uh, the five-year average. And uh, I'm, I'm putting Spencer on, not because he agrees with me, but because it's a really good report. So, Spencer, thank you very much. And uh, over to you. Hello, Dr. Campbell. Greetings from the state of Texas. My name is Spencer Carlson. I'm currently at home recovering from COVID. I wanted to share some comments regarding your recent video discussing the freedom of information data uh, that you found somewhat troubling, indicating that COVID as the primary cause of death ended up being a remarkably low number of the total attributed COVID deaths. Uh, we had a similar debate here in the States uh, back in September 2020 when the CDC indicated that COVID being the only cause of death attributed was attributed to 6% of the total COVID deaths reported. So a very small number of the COVID deaths had COVID as the only cause. Um, this caused a significant amount of debate here as well on what the true way to understand deaths uh, was. And I think you were spot on when you referenced the um, excess deaths being the, the best way to approach the, the death toll of COVID. What I would wanna propose, consider secondary causes of death where people go on to live very long and fruitful lives such as uh, diabetes, hypertension, um, obesity, and a, a number of other factors. And I think this is a lot easier to see if we dig in a little deeper to the excess death data. Looking at the CDC death data going all the way back to 1999, we can see fairly consistent growth in the deaths in the United States. It averages a 1% growth per year, per year and correlates most closely with population growth. Uh, but then we see something remarkable in 2020. Uh, when we go from 2019 to 2020, we have a 18.5% increase to three point, almost 3.4 million deaths. Um, if we look at the deaths we would have expected with that 1% growth rate, we would have expected two point, almost 2.9 million deaths. So we have 500,000 unexplained deaths. Well, when we look at the different attributed causes of death, the top 15 causes of death in the states as reported in the CDC data, we see that those top 15 causes do account for 80% about uh, of the total deaths uh, that we're discussing. We see that heart disease is always number one, cancer is always number two, and we see that COVID in 2020 was credited with 351,000 of the, that 500,000 of unexplained deaths. Um, but what I've done is highlighted in red the year in which we saw the highest percentage increase in a particular cause of death. So heart disease had its highest percentage increase in death in 2020. Same with cancer and a number of other factors. And we could say, well, maybe there were folks that didn't receive appropriate medical care because hospitals were so busy. Uh, but I also think it's important to consider that we may have significantly undercounted the COVID-associated deaths. 
uh, when we see this much of an increase in all of these different factors, uh, something that has a, for example, a very, very constant or, or low volatility growth rate like hypertension, uh, that it had a significant increase in the percentage, um, per- significant percentage increase in deaths. That to me indicates the most likely scenarios we're missing some COVID interactions and almost certainly have undercounted the true COVID uh, death toll. Um, obviously, there are things like accidents that would not be able to be explained by COVID. Why were there significantly more accidents? And maybe that's noise in the data. Uh, b- but interesting data, I'm curious to see how it plays out in 2021. And just something to consider, I, I do think uh, excess deaths it gives us a much better idea of the death toll from COVID. Okay, thank you very much for that, Spencer. I think we can possibly turn you off now. I'm not sure. and I'm not quite sure if I have the technology. There we go. <laughs> Sorry for these technological problems. So Spencer's pointing out there that in 2020, heart disease, sepsis, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, liver disease, diabetes mellitus all up partly because people aren't seeking care or getting the care they needed and partly because covid is exacerbating these conditions therefore the actual death toll of the pandemic could be higher than we had thought which is a a sobering figure in that respect so thank you for that and uh, thank you for watching this video